This conference will now be recorded. All right. Well, welcome everyone to the operations subcommittee meeting. Um, I am going to ask that members of the committee please go around and just introduce yourself so that we have uh, your name on the record. Uh, if we could have Kristen, Jackie, and then Crystal introduce themselves. Hi, everybody. It's Kristen Trustman. Hi, everyone. Jackie Malay, Mayor of the City of Lone Tree. And if it's uh, Chris, Chris, and yeah, Chris Frampton. Chris Frampton. I see Crystal. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. This is Kristen Murillo, Aurora City Council member. Thank you. And then Elise Jones just joined. Sorry to be a few minutes late. You're good. Thank you, Elise. And then Troy. Good afternoon, Troy Whitmore, RTD board member from Adams County. Great. Thank you, everyone. Um, as you all see in the packet, I'm not going to go through the October 7th uh, meeting summary, but if folks have any questions or comments, if we wouldn't mind getting those over to the Dr. Cog team. Um, I am going to go ahead and move us through the agenda since we have a, quite a jam-packed uh, conversation ahead of us. So um, we're going to start with discussion item number four, which is the Operations Subcommittee Strategic Priorities. Um, that is in attachment B, but for ease, I have shared a PowerPoint presentation that Matthew now has on the screen. Matthew, would you mind making that just a little bit bigger? And if not, that is okay, we can make do. I think that's okay. Let's go ahead and just go with what we have on the screen because each of you has this on your packet, in your packet as well. So um, as a reminder, uh, what you see on the screen right now are the core problems that the entire RTD Accountability Committee is charged with addressing. Um, and so the next four slides really just lay out a couple of things that I'm hoping we can have um, a brief discussion on. We'll spend about 10, 15 minutes on this before we transition into the next item on the agenda. Um, but what I'd really like to do is number one, get consensus with this uh, operations subcommittee, that these are the priorities that we wanna focus on. Um, and I also just wanna um, highlight how how our priorities ultimately connect to the overall core problems that we are addressing um, as a as a committee of the whole. Um, so I'm not going to go through and read these. As I mentioned, these are on your um, or in your packet. Um, Matthew, if you wouldn't mind going to the next slide. So these committee um, priorities are what we identified at our last meeting, um, and I know our uh, Overall co-chairs, Elise and Crystal, have gone through and put some real uh, thought into what our potential priorities could be. And, and um, so we want to spend a little bit of time going through these. Um, the first one, assess and make recommendations on how RTD fares and past programs can be improved to increase equity, ridership, affordability, and ease. Um, the next priority around making recommendations that enhance uh, service delivery. Um, the third is around uh, focus on proactive community-based transit service. Um, the fourth one. You know, can I can I interrupt you? Because I, I I was going to tell Matthew if you scroll up, there's a thing that says presenter options right underneath that blue eye display settings. <laughs> and I think if you click on display settings, you can choose to get rid of this presenter version. Yep. Swap. Uh, swap. Swap. It should be. See what? Well, maybe. I don't know. Let's try that. There you go. Chris. There you go. Sorry, I'm done. It's not usually like that. Maybe I'll see you guys later. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Chris. You saved the day. Um, so these are the committees again, or the the committee sub priorities again. These are in our packet, but I wanted to give you all just a moment to to read through them before we walk through a little bit of an exercise as a team. So just take a moment to quietly read to yourself.
And as you're reviewing these subcommittee priorities, if something is not clear or we need to have a little bit more of a discussion, um, I invite you all to, to go ahead and, and offer something for this committee to discuss. I have a question that I hope isn't naive or stupid. So in number two, um, well, no, it is naive and stupid. I think that's actually a better way to put it. In, in number two in particular, where we say make recommendations on how RTD can enhance service delivery to transit reliant, vulnerable populations through the different models of service delivery and changing travel trends. One of the things I don't quite get, and, and maybe I need to, is what the challenge is with the, the quote unquote vulnerable populations, which is not quite a term that I completely understand. It, it, I mean, the, the, the bus generally is serving for the most part, bus transit and, and all the transit that we offer is generally serving those folks today, I think. But maybe there's something I'm missing there. And so I'm not quite sure how to translate that into an operational goal. It, does that make sense? So I'm not saying that isn't a good goal or that isn't a good mission of RTD. But what I'm saying is I'm not sure what we're missing or how that's an operational goal. And I've, I've struggled with that a few times. So. Again, always playing catch up, but um, maybe a little feedback. Yeah, Elise, you know, or Kristen. Kristen. One of the things that RTD struggles with is making it easy for a person in a wheelchair to use the fixed route buses. RTD uses the very bare minimum of the ADA measurements and requirements so the space for a wheelchair on the bus is exactly what the measurements are of the chair that i'm in it does not allow another two inches for the tie downs it does not allow for um basically parallel parking so unless you can stay in the aisle and go directly to the right or the left which is impossible you really have to fight i struggle to get into the spots on the fixed route buses and i would imagine Kristen, that that relates to a little sorry lise a little bit of experience totally different and but we develop a lot of new condominiums and they're sort of the ada requirement that is asked of us and then what we always say is well folks who are challenged in this way are challenged all differently and so this sort of basic concept is it might be a component of that too. Is that a fair, because you have your chair, somebody else has a different kind of chair, somebody else doesn't need a chair, but they need a, a exactly. smoother entry. They can't get up the stairs easily enough. I, I would imagine there's a, a number of those kinds of things. It, you, you hit the nail on the head as far as you make the condos accessible according to the measurements. Right, mm -hmm. right. That doesn't work for everyone. You're right. Yeah. But it, it is difficult for me to use the fixed route buses. Elise, you have a, a comment? You're on mute. I was just going to add that um, I think there's a sense that RTD could do better at providing service to these populations. So um, how, so there are perhaps creative and innovative and more cost-effective ways that that could happen because we don't have bus routes going to all of these communities or not at the frequency or the times necessarily. So um, can we use other um, models, you know, and, and some of these are lifted and listed out. Um, maybe these populations are dispersed such that it, it doesn't, it's not cost effective to support a full bus route, but maybe um, we we can deploy other service providers to address that. So that's also a piece of that. Um, mm -hmm. it, it it operates from the assumption that there's room for improvement um, in terms of meeting the needs of our our transit reliant populations and uh, truthfully other populations as well. But certainly we're we're placing an emphasis um, on equity here. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Thank you. I appreciate that moment. I also want to check in with you, Chris, because I think part of this conversation is also looking up additional information that we need as we're starting to dive into these priorities. And one could be just a better understanding of, of maybe what um, 
what are the challenges that writers have have expressed to RTD when it comes to enhance when it comes to their service delivery? Um, I'm also thinking there might be some information from the Reimagine RTD process around the ridership and what that looks like that we might want to bring in. So that would that would be information that we need to really inform what this priority or where we land in terms of this priority. I just want to check in with you to see. If well, I, look, I think from personally from a high level, I. These things are at odds with each other, but I'm sort of okay with that. I like that. So I, I, for me, I think that what I don't see yet or quite understand, I, I understand some of the anecdotal personal ep, uh, evidence isn't the right word, um, proof that we've got this challenge. I, mm -hmm. I think it's also interesting and collectively very helpful for folks to really have a metric and a goal. Um, because if the goal is just better, um, that, that leaves it pretty wide open. So yeah. You know that, and, and honestly, that may be enough that that's a recommendation from our committee. Like, hey, you guys need to figure out what is it, you know, and then how do we measure that? Um, and that is not just measuring a, a calculated mathematical thing. It's not just we we service this many people in these many minutes or whatever, uh, which is why I brought up net promoter scores before. It, you know, mm -hmm. it, you know, customers having a good experience, and that, and when they're asking if they have a good experience, they they mean the whole thing. They mean how long did they have to wait? How long did it take them to get there? Was the driver nice? Was it clean? You know, uh, I got off and it was a short walk to my office. You know, it was a, uh, it, it was easy for me to navigate over to where I needed to go. So all of that stuff is, you know, relates in, into something. So I don't know. It feels like it's hard to put all this together into kind of one number or one one answer. That's always hard. So um, I don't want to overstate that, but. It does feel to me like that's some stuff. And, and again, one of those things where I may very well be playing catch up. Elise. Not to belabor this, but I guess two other things. One is throughout the system, we have an issue with first and final mile mm -hmm. and getting people at the transit route for all populations, but, but certainly our transit reliant populations. Um, and if there is a, a innovative cost-effective way for us to um, help solve that, Mm -hmm. That speaks to this. And then I guess the other thing I would would add is that we have a constant um, ongoing conversation with RTD about surface cuts they're trying to make um, in our region. And so um, some of those service cuts uh, are for um, transit reliant populations, but but maybe they're not at a certain density. So mm -hmm. is there a way, uh, are there other ways that we can, can um, so it's more than Mm -hmm. I, I want to put it positive. It's more than just can we do better. It's we're not doing good enough now. And yeah. if you want yeah, us yeah. to quantify that, we can. And I hear you. We need to be metric driven here. But uh, there is this is one of the driving reasons that the accountability mm -hmm. committee was formed is is exactly. the the perception that we aren't we aren't where we need to be. Thank you, Elise. Jackie, I see your hand was raised. And the other issue we have found is getting these popular transit dependent populations to anchor institutions that they need to have service and i just didn't see that in in here and one of the challenges when they cut or we're talking about cutting a, a bus route in douglas county it was the way seniors were accessing sky ridge hospital and it was mm. um and so uh Anyway, I think I think getting to these anchor, inst whether it's a health institution, it's health and human services needs, um, or uh, potentially schools, even grocery stores. Um, uh, so I didn't see that in there. And I'm not sure if this fits or where it might fit, but, um, And I don't know that it's RTD's responsibility, but I think there's certainly an opportunity with the air quality um, challenges that our region is facing and the amount that our transportation sector contributes to those. Is there an opportunity? Um, again, I'm not sure where it goes, but I'm just gonna throw it out there for, for the, you know, the environmental benefits of people using um, mass transit uh, versus individual car trips. So, um, mm -hmm. and and where that might fit in. I mean, I, you know, I would love to see an eco pass program potentially geared towards large employers along mass transit routes that can help with the employee trip reduction program. And is there a way to partner with the RAC to design a program? Um, 
So those are just some things in my mind that I've been thinking about. And again, not quite sure where they fit, but would love to hear some reaction. If I can make a suggestion or at least a recommendation on the anchor institutions, um, it sounds like that might be worth calling out as a as a bullet point under possibly number two and number three um, and within those priorities, just identifying how anchor institutions are engaged. The air quality, I could see that maybe being embedded into priority number two and certainly in priority number five. Priority number five likely needs to be revamped a little bit more to get to what like the meat of what we're really talking about when in terms of recommendation. But I just and want so to check in. These are our these are our so like I don't think I do we have as a priority considering reloading rear loading of buses. So we would have that within um I think we need to make it explicit in number two because right now we're talking about it in terms of COVID um in COVID recovery okay. isn't it under number one now i think it also is in number one yeah. some of these seem to overlap so i think actually um matthew if you wouldn't mind going into the next slide uh there's a lot of different ways to cut these priorities and one thing that i wanted to just share with you all um, was at least my attempt to show how our priorities are addressing might be addressing problem areas. So what the overall charge is of the committee. Um, and I'm happy to, to, to go through these, but just one thing that I wanted to point out, it seems like the FAIR passes um, or the FAIR and the past programs might be the first place for us to start. That's That was my general sense at our last meeting. Um, and it also seems like it addresses a, multiple core problems that the overall committee should address. Um, so I wanted to just check in with folks to see if that still makes sense. And it seemed like the second, which was a, making recommendations on how to enhance service delivery to transit reliant and vulnerable populations seemed like another area that we might want to explore, especially in terms of COVID recovery. So it seemed like based on priorities and overall problems, like these two seemed like they, they rose to the top. But I want to check in with folks. And I also want to hear from folks that I haven't heard from yet. So Crystal and Troy, if you all have anything else or anything to add in terms of reactions. Uh, I mean, it sounds good. Add, um, but I may later in the meeting. Thank you, Madam Chair. Crystal. Okay. How are folks feeling about this in terms of starting, like continuing to start with the fair passes, which we're going to have a substantial amount of our agenda focused on that today, um, but really having that be our, our main priority at this time? Is that feeling? Okay, feels good. Matthew, if you wouldn't mind going into the next slide, this is just another way to cut it. Um, I also recognize that there's a lot of overlap between the other committees, and I see uh, Rutt Bridges is on the call, um, the, the chair of our finance committee. So this is just uh, a way of showing that the work of this committee, uh, subcommittee, will certainly need to be coordinated with our finance committee. And I'm thinking specifically the FAIR and the PASS programs. That's something that we'll want to make sure that we are crystal clear about and what the, the impacts are. Um, I'm also just uh, very aware of how each of these are going to impact others. So. Um, including the governance and the finance. So I just wanted to share this with you all in terms of coordination and how we want how we might want to continue sharing out that information with our with our peers on the on the broader committee. So do we have um just again sorry but where we say enhance service delivery is it one of our challenges that if we want to add things we can't yes so isn't it enhance implies more i wonder if it's maybe optimize mm. how do others feel about that well i think it was strategically written to allow us to do both or one or the other enhance means sort of improve which could mean add additional service the other could be do it cheaper or do it better so I, I don't know that we want to necessarily limit ourselves. 
because we're, we're talking about making changes to RTD for its life post COVID. You know, this committee is not trying to necessarily solve the next 12 months. Yes, yeah, right? sure, totally. So yeah. We don't want to be stuck in just providing the services that RTD was doing before the pandemic. We want to okay. make this the best transit agency. So, okay. That's why it was written that way. I'm not, I don't want to. We can no, it's it. fine. I mean, I like, listen, I like the optimism. I believe in it. I think one of the things, that, you know, listening to everybody, it's just a lot, a lot of balls in the air. Yes. <laughs> and I don't think our, our problems are not COVID related. We have right. COVID related problems, but this committee was being formed before COVID was a known entity. Um, and so um, the, 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 the budget was empty, the pot was empty before. So. But uh, Chris, one of the ways we might be able to enhance service is through partnerships, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't think we should assume that all of these are, gotcha. are all of our recommendations will be strictly up to RTD to implement. It's that we would make a recommendation about how partners could solve some of these as well. Cool. I'll stop interrupting, I, just, I swear. <laughs> I like when you interrupt, so it means I'm not the only one, Chris, so keep it up. <laughs> I would also say that having RTD um, provide better service um, will build trust, which will then cause people to want to invest. So mm -hmm. I, I, I'll be honest, I think in the long term, we're going to have to generate more revenues for RTD. And that means probably going back to that's, the ballot and asking for some. That's, that's cyclical thing, right? we can't do right? that now because there's not so part of this. So, and yeah. it, it was pointed yeah. out to, to to me that while we're we're in number two focusing on transit reliant populations we also don't want to leave behind our commuter populations they and this maybe is where the air quality climate change piece comes in we need more people to ride transit who don't have to ride transit the you know the fate of our planet and our ability to breathe clean air depends on people us convincing more people to get on the bus and rail. So I don't want to lose sight of that. It's not um, sort of highlighted as the top priority, but it's sort of inherent in increasing ridership, um, which is embedded a little bit in the fares and past programs. Is there, is there a term to art for that, like commuter by choice? Like I, I have a woman in my office who loves RTD and she's, she's transit reliant in that she organizes her life around it, but she does it because she likes riding the bus and train and her shuttle from uh, down at the mineral station. She's got it kind of all dialed in. Um, she's a good customer, right? She, yeah. she pays, I mean, she's, you know. Those are typically referred to, at least in the transit equity world, as choice riders, because they have the, the choice to That's ride. Right. But I think um, lifting that up within the recommendation or um, the audiences, if you will, within our, our overall recommendations, I think is gonna be really important. The other thing I just want to um, acknowledge that we are, it sounds like in terms of priorities, we're still aligned with what we've laid out. They still seem very important. The order that they're in seems like it's probably the most relevant and timely given where we are right now, but we can have some flexibility in how we how we shift and how we pivot and how we maybe in, um, intersect some of these recommendations with others. Because as I mentioned, there's a lot of different ways to slice it. So um, with that, I'm just going to, I'm very cognizant of time and um, I want us to get into the work <laughs> of understanding the fares in the past programs. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and turn it over um, to, to Matthew and to Monica, um, who will be joining us on the RTD Live presentation. Thank you, everyone. All righty. Um, well, thanks, everyone, for inviting me here. Um, my name is Monica treipel -Harnke. I'm Senior Manager of Revenue at RTD, and I was uh, in charge of implementing the LIVE program. So I have a lot of information about it. I will probably be fast uh, with the slides because I know the time is limited, um, but definitely um, you know, I'm available for questions now or later. Um, so I'll just kind of jump in. And uh, maybe it's easiest if you go to that slideshow. Um, I don't see the whole screen, sorry, for the whole slide, I guess is what I'm trying to say. 
Do others see that? It, for some reason, it's frozen. I don't know. Okay. I'm so sorry. No problem. So I can I can try it like this. Let's see if that works. But it's just not letting me. Uh, it's saying enable. Yeah, okay, you can just click enable. that. You okay. just you can just, just click that. That enable content. Yeah, I I've, I've been clicking it. It's frozen. Oh. Okay. Well. I'm so sorry. I, mean, I don't I know. Can... I didn't expect this. All right. Well, you know, it's all right. We'll just kind of scroll. I'll start on the top, and then we'll just have to. If you, if you would be so kind, then to scroll down. This is sure. the same. Sorry. This is no problem. This is the Live Income Based Fair Discount Program. I'm going to give you a little bit of a background as far as what the customer experiences and also what we as RTD, how, how the administration works and how a little bit of the, the history and next steps. So um, if you could go to the next slide. It's not moving. I'm so sorry. I don't know what's going on. It's, it's not moving at all. Um, Matthew, try clicking on the slide on the left hand side of the screen. Yeah, I've tried that too. Oh, darn it, it's frozen. Let me try and reload. I'm so sorry. Technology, everyone. I know. <laughs> If you think it's easier, if I, if you make me the presenter, that works too, but let's try what. Well, um, if, if I just, I could just talk also uh, and pull up my own copy since everyone else I think has a copy. Should I do that? Let's see if I can make you the presenter. Okay. Here we go. See if that works. Okay. Uh, people can see your screen. This is the live web page. I will just um, let me very. Sorry, right, now I have to pull it up because I didn't have it up. Um... Let's see. Yeah, I think it was here. Sorry. Shouldn't take long. All righty. So let's see if this works any better. Um, and see if I can go to the. Oops, no. Okay. I seem to have issues too because we. Never use go to. All right. Okay. Let's see. Is this a? Uh... All right. I'll I'll use this. Can can everyone see it well? Yes. Excellent. All right. Uh, so I just want to make a plug for our, um, or just let people know um, that we have four different fair discount programs. Uh, people sometimes. Don't realize that. Uh, and just briefly, it's for seniors, 65 and older, uh, for youth, um, ages 6 to 19, individuals with disabilities, and then uh, the LIFT program that we're talking about today. Um, now, this is the history, um, or brief history. This is a, a low-income fair uh, was uh, requested by the community for many years i understand it definitely predates me so this has been an ongoing conversation um in 2017-18 uh, a past program working group met and that's uh 25 members from rtd and stakeholder organizations and they looked at the entire rtd fair structure all fair products the pricing uh and the Overall recommendation included a reduced fare for um, riders with incomes that are at or below 185% of the federal poverty guidelines. Um, and so, and the re recommendation was also a 40% discount. Um, now, this was kind of part of a packet that had to be revenue neutral. So, the discount percentage, the income threshold, 
and also the fair products offered, which we'll see later, were all based on, a, on modeling by a consultant to ensure that the, all the overall changes were revenue neutral. So we could still hit those revenue targets in the, in the financial plans. Um, it was then, it is part of our current board approved fair structure. Um, it started in 2019 uh, as the fair structure and LIF uh, was implement, launched in July 2019. Um, and then we also, in January 2020, transitioned the RTD nonprofit program rules uh, to LIF, meaning organizations can buy LIF tickets to give to clients, but the clients have to be enrolled in LIF. And that's a different to the old program, and we can go into that a little bit later when I talk about some pain points or challenges. Um, so that's the brief history. Um, just you know, very briefly, if you're you're eligible, if you live in the RTD district, uh, your home address are between the ages of 20 and 64. We already talked about the discounts, the age-based discounts for youth and seniors, and uh, the 185 percent of the federal poverty level. Um, that's the gross household income. It's not, you know, depends on your household, basically, long story short. Um, application is online through the Colorado Peak website. Um, uh, phone applications are also offered uh, through Denver Human Services. We contract with Denver Human Services um, for customer service and application help and um, processing some income information. Uh, that doesn't mean that it's just for residents of Denver. Uh, it's just, um, you know, we contracted with one human services agency because it's easier than to contract with eight. So they're taking care of all RTD customers, no matter where they, where they live. Um, if someone is already enrolled in uh, SNAP, Medicaid, or Colorado Works, um, it's a lot easier because they are automatically income qualified for LIVE. The PEAK system can check that, that they are enrolled and can automatically approve. If they're not enrolled, then they provide income information and documentation and uh, Denver Human Services will take a look, like an actual person. Um, if an application is approved, um, the customer will get a LIVE discount card in the mail. Um, and they, you know, as you can see, um, name, uh, photo, and expiration date. Um, and that's what they will show uh, when they use the discounted fair products. Um, so that's our general approach for all discounts at RTD, and that's different than some other agencies. For some agencies, you have to show proof of uh, enrollment or eligibility when you purchase fair media um, at RTD. Uh, anyone can buy, for example, a live mobile ticket or a My Right card or a youth card. Um, so it's more convenient for people to buy, you know, for their whole family or other people. Um, but then the proof of eligibility comes when people board the vehicle uh, or when they're on the train and are asked by a fair inspector. Um, and for the LIFT program, there's only one proof of eligibility, and that is the LIFT discount card that you see. Um, there's three types of fair products that are offered for LIFT, so it's not for everything. Or you cannot, there's not a LIFT version of everything that we offer, I guess is the better way to say it. So on mobile tickets, uh, you can buy LIFT um, three-hour passes and day passes. Uh, we have a Live My Right card, uh, which is a reloadable fair payment card, um, and that's a three-hour pass. And then a 10 right ticket that's uh, available through uh, nonprofit organizations and government agencies, and that's um, through the RTD nonprofit program. So those organizations will buy those tickets and then give them out to their clients, um, depending on their mission um, and they will usually give them out for free, sometimes charge a little. So those are the only three things or that's the, or the four things, I guess. Three hour pass on mobile, three hour pass on my right, three hour pass, three hour pass on 10 right, the paper ticket and also the date pass on mobile. Um, 
a little bit on statistics. Um, and you can, at the end of the presentation, I put in a link to the board reports. We give a monthly update about LIV to the um, Finance and Administration and Administration Committee of our board. And I took those numbers from there. Every month um, we write an update with the newest numbers and maybe you know recent developments, next steps we're taking. So um, so far we've had um, 12,300 applications submitted um, since the program started in July of last year. Um, about 62% of those were approved, um, about 30% denied. Uh, most of those were outside the age range, so the um, the system just automatically denies people and tells them, hey, we have this other program, this other district, sorry, this other discount that actually offers better savings. Um, they may not work, live in the district or they have not uploaded a photo. Um, the photo, we'll also talk about that, also turned out to be a bigger pain point than we expected. Um, and then we have 8% of the people who have submitted an application of pending and they also um, haven't uploaded a photo yet. Um, and Denver Human Services is contacted them, contacting them and we're sending a letter saying, please upload a photo, this is how you do it. Um, the purchases, um, it's hard to talk about the number of trips because we can only, we can't track really a lot of the fair media that we offer. Um, but basically, we know about 15,000 trips with my ride, um, about 38,600 mobile tickets and day passes were bought, and um, about 140,000 uh, paper tickets were purchased by the government agencies and the nonprofit organizations that we work with. Um, impact of COVID. Um, of course, COVID has affected um, the LIFT program just as, as it has affected everything else. Um, there's definitely been a decrease in applications. Um, there's lower ridership overall, and we temporarily suspended fare collection uh, in the late spring and in the late spring. Um, so for example, we had uh, 230 people sign up in a week, sign up in the beginning of March. Um, by June, July, it had dropped to about 50. And then now we are up to 125 a week, which is, of course, is lower than we would like. Um, but people are not writing as much as we all know. Um, there's also a decrease in the fair media purchases, um, but it was less pronounced than the decrease around the entire RTD writer group. So definitely, you know, we can't assume that there is more um, people who, you know, are not going to work from home in so many words. They're more essential workers um, and use transit for, um, I guess, more transit reliance. Um, at Denver Human Services, uh, we used to be able to offer a walk-in application for people who face barriers to um, applying online. Uh, and the, you know, obviously that was suspended. Um, and now we, because of that, we introduced a phone application option, um, which is basically um, an applicant can call Denver Human Services and they will walk them through while the um, eligibility worker at Human Services actually types in the information into the PEAK system. Um, so, you know, and that seems to be working quite well. It's pretty popular and we uh, plan to keep offering that option even when people can go back um, for, to in-person application. Um, of course, outreach um, is limited. Um, especially for a while there, um, our outreach, um, community outreach folks here at RTD and also at um, DHS went to events, uh, met with groups, and, you know, there's still some of that going on virtual, 
um, but it's definitely you know better to go there in person right but you know there's electronic communications virtual meetings and we have a lift toolkit for community partners um, that they can use um, next steps um, so I'm just kind of I, I talked about some challenges um, and some of the challenges are that um, you know people do have um, do have um, barriers to applying online so some of the um, you know of course the the phone application is helping um, but also we were talking with homeless services organizations and other uh, service organizations they said well we would love you know we um, don't have the resources we don't have the time to help people sign up um, to assist with that application and we don't have the so we figured a good solution would be to have um, a dedicated person to go to different you know initially by focus on um, homeless services providers but go to different locations throughout the district maybe in a weekly schedule that people can rely on and basically be there in person once that's possible with COVID and help with applications, answer questions, um, and they'll even be able to answer questions about other assistance programs um, that are you know, by the state or the federal government. So, oops, sorry, I did the wrong thing. So that should help um, organizations you know, that have, um, work with populations that are that have more barriers basically and just in general help help get the word out and help people apply there's another um there's another project in the works um to and that also came with meetings with homeless services providers so our the system worked pretty well if you are um you know if you if you there's a little bit of a time lag. Um, ideally, if you already, if you, everything works fine, you apply, you upload a, a photo, um, maybe you can already be approved by the system because you're already enrolled in SNAP. You should get your ID card in the mail within, you know, seven to 10 business days. Often it's even shorter. Um, but of course, if you are in a homeless service organization, or in other um, providers, maybe who work with um, other shelters, people in emergency situations, people can't wait. Mm -hmm. um, and the providers, of course, don't want to give them a full fare ticket, which is really the, the only option uh, without the live enrollment. Um, so that's where we're working with them uh, and even have some grant money to implement a temporary live ID card. Where they could issue that card you know the person applies they issue it right away um, and then you know they get a, a real card shall we say like in the mail that's good for a whole year so that's something that's going on and someone had a question yeah monica i just want to um, be mindful of time if we can move on to the last slide and then if folks have any questions if they wouldn't mind just typing them into the chat box that would be great okay all right um, the only other things that's happening right now is a survey is going out to participants. This one is really just for your reading pleasure for later on, um, because we're always looking for people to help with outreach and organizations, of course. And this is the informational other information uh, that you can, you know, find out. So that was really the end of my slide deck. Great. Thank you. Um, I am going to propose, since we do have one additional presentation, um, if folks have, I think we'll take one question, um, if folks have something that they would like, a burning question that they would like answered um, right now before we move on to the next presentation, which is on fair equity discussion. Not seeing any questions on the LIF program. Well, Monica, you did a great job explaining it. Jackie, it looks like you might be unmuting yourself. <laughs> I'm typing. I'm typing a question. All right. 
Um, well, thank you so much, Monica, for providing that information. I don't know that we have that slide deck, so if you wouldn't mind sending that over um, to the Dr. Cog team. It didn't look like it was in the official packet, but I want to make sure that folks have that information. And if you have um, specific questions, we can enter the chat box and then we can get those uh, responses uh, you know, for all of us. So. Dr. Cog staff does have the presentation. We just received it. We only made We only made the request uh, recently, so um, the, uh, we we had to send out the materials before we got it, but we will send the additional presentations soon. Turn it over to you for our fair equity discussion. Thank you so much. Mark. Can it's everyone hear me? There's a bit of static. It looks like it is Chris's microphone. There we go. Thank you. All right, we I am going to try loud and get HVAC system, and we built the building, so I'm feel like an idiot when I'm on my property. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I'm going to go through this presentation pretty quickly. Uh, so, um, just wanted to introduce uh, a couple other um, case studies on. Um, fair equity throughout the country. So, and there we go. Uh, so two case studies, uh, one in Portland and one in Kansas City. So, too much, here we go. Um, in Portland, they have a, um, a transit equity program that includes a de decriminalization of fare evasion, uh, but also uh, they provide uh, uh, approximately eight and a half million dollars in free or reduced fares. Uh, uh, and those, that, that um, equates to uh, uh, 50 to 72 percent uh, discount based on um, the, 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 the um, fair medium that's purchased. If it's one trip, it's it's 50%, but if it's a monthly pass, it's a 72% discount. And uh, the requirements are that they might must be 18 to 64, an Oregon resident, and make less than double the federal poverty level. Um, uh, it's important to note, and this was noted in the LIB presentation, that uh, a 50% discount is um, required for persons um, 65 and older and individuals with disabilities. So that's why uh, they, they have this um, 18 to 64. And so it's provided on a, um, a, a reloadable fare medium. Uh, so it makes it very easy uh, for participants to just tap. It's just like an eco pass. And it's paid for with revenue from a uh, state payroll tax equal to one tenth of, of 1% that, that goes toward transportation statewide. And so this is how they use it in Portland. Um, and the reason why I note this is this is, uh, this is how the program is paid for. Obviously with Tabor, uh, our, our state legislature can't do something quite like that. But what they could do uh, is um, put something onto the ballot uh, for a tax increase or there is a cap in um, the FASTER program at, that um, caps it at uh, $15 million per year for transit, even as um, revenue from the fees uh, gener uh, um, generates more and more uh, revenue um, each year. So uh, there are two possible ways that the legislature uh, could take action. Uh, if this was a recommendation that uh, the legislature wanted to act on. Wanted to point out one other example. Uh, you may have heard uh, in the news uh, in the past year that in Kansas City, uh, they, uh, they are uh, working on zero fare for transit. And so uh, this is specifically for buses because streetcars already are fare free. And the estimated annual cost is approximately $8 million. It's been proposed and, and put uh, into the Kansas City budget, uh, approximately $4.8 uh, 4 million. 
uh, and then also a push uh, to make up the difference from the private sector. Um, I, I also point out here uh, that um, the costs RTD to implement a fair free, uh, uh, if they were to, and this is if RTD were to eliminate um, all the revenue that's generated from fares, that's approximately $150 million. So that, that's pretty significant. Obviously, Kansas City is a much smaller system, and so the cost is less. They also charge less in fares, so um, the, the, the revenue that needs to be made up is less. So it's, it's not apples to apples, but I wanted to just point out um, that uh, that is also an example. And um, that is all I have. I just wanted to um, generate some conversation and just provide some examples. Happy to take any questions. Are there uh, any other, um, quote unquote, and I grew up in, the, in Eagle County, which is a free bus system. I, I think it's still the largest. So Kansas City would obviously pass that. But maybe I don't know. Are there other ones that run free? So Kansas City is the first major U.S. city to propose free transit, uh, free fares for transit. Uh, there, there are several much smaller communities around the country uh, that, that, that go fare free, but Kansas City is the first major city. So I, I don't know exactly um, what that population threshold to be a major U.S. city is, but uh, I'm well, it, I, isn't, I estimate... it isn't Eagle County, Matthew. We know that. No, we got no, 80,000 people up there. <laughs> but I will say, you know, we have pioneered fare free system. Of, like the, the community of Longmont has fare free buses. Um, the town of Netherland, everybody in the town has an eco pass. So you're not riding for free because there's a mill levy that pays for it. But it, basically, everybody just flashes their pass to get on. Mm -hmm. um, the bus in Netherlands. So they, the idea has been pioneered on a small scale elsewhere. I have a question, Matthew. Have they studied um, the impact of on ridership from these programs? Have they done any assessments? Um, you know, I, I I can get back to you on on that. I ha I didn't I didn't look specifically for that. So anecdotally, um, the city of Lone Tree had pre-COVID, we had a free intra-city transit that the city was paying for. Um, and we had talked about, uh, we explored, should we have some nominal fee for that? And um, all evidence suggested uh, that our ridership would drop significantly if we did. And I know the town of Castle Rock at one point had some kind of a service and the minute they started charging for it, it went down. And I think Roaring Fork uh, Transit I had also had some experience and the cost to uh, collect the monies and um, uh, and it just, it, it was, they had more ridership without it. But I also think we need to keep in mind the geography that we're talking about. Uh, we're talking about a system the size of a smaller state and with a, so I think um, that's just like Lone Tree with the intra-city transit, maybe it does make some sense, but as an entire system, I guess I'm just gonna say, I think it's unrealistic to think um, uh, that we could really look at doing something like what was done in Kansas City in, uh, for RTD. You know, Jackie, I don't, oh, sorry. Sorry, I was just gonna ask Matthew, maybe for the next meeting, whether it's, um... I'm just trying to think through, you know, the past program working group, which resulted with the affordable fare program being implemented, did some really good analysis. I just wonder if maybe we could see some of that information, because I think it, if I remember correctly, it did model a variety of different past programs and structures that might be helpful for this group. And if there's a way to maybe get some of that updated information, that would also be helpful. Chris, you had a, a comment. Well, two, two things. I threw a, a, a link into a story from Vox about the Kansas City program. It seems long, so maybe it's got valuable information. I haven't read it. Uh, you know, two is, I'm jumping way too far ahead. RTD owns a lot of real estate in a land lease structure, which is done by governments all over the world. Um, my bet would produce $150 million. Now, it would take a a bridge time period to get to the point where you could do that, but it could do it. It could not produce the full operating budget by any means of RTD, but if we were looking for something. Mm -hmm. 
yeah i think this gets to the 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 earlier just point or comment that what we do has impacts and what the finance committee does has impacts on on us right yeah. when we talk about yeah. and i think that and i think that one is as much related to the governance yeah and the governance yeah mm -hmm. um so thank you Matthew. Oh, okay. I just want to also suggest, though, that 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 one hundred and fifty uh, million dollar figure is not enough, right? So the system is having is challenged with that. So it's we would need to be generating far more than that to to uh, address the sustainability issues uh, that that the organization is facing. So one step at a time. Right. <laughs> and there's a big distance between no fares and lower fares too. So yeah, yeah. I think that modeling from the past program working group, and I, I know it's likely outdated at this point, but it modeled it at, at a variety of different fair structures, which I think it would just be helpful for us to also get that level of grounding. Maybe we could spend some time on that during our next meeting if that would be helpful for folks. I see a couple of heads shaking. Yep. And Madam Chair, this is Heather McKillop at RTD. Um, we provided um, uh, those documents from the past working group to Matthew, so they should be available. And if there's anything missing, just let us know and we'll try to find it. Great, thank you, Heather. Uh, Brett, you had a comment or question? I just want to make a brief comment. It, it's interesting to note that we, the widening of I-70 that we're doing right now, we, we'll spend about 1.2 billion before all the interest and additional charges over time on that project. and. The ability to really drive ridership on RTD in a big way could have other implications. There's also a huge cost to trend to congestion in Denver. Uh, this is something that, you, that UT Austin does studies for the whole country of major areas. And so there's a, there's a real payback from finding good ways uh, to basically drive ridership a lot. I'll say on the other hand that right now in this budget, I would be crazy to say here's what we now need to do. But uh, it's something that we got to keep in our minds that there there are some person there that well there you know what right. to and, and and this is off topic and I know we're trying to end so I'll I'll be short. That uh widening of I-70 has room. I mean everybody knows there's extra space in those lanes. And so operationally, what's an easy win for us, we could get one of those lanes to belong to just the buses. Right. I mean. This gets into the, the operation yeah. piece, right? How do we start to look at bus rapid transit a little bit differently right. to point number two? So don't I just wanna- Don't quote me as knowing there's extra lanes, even though everybody knows it, nobody likes, don't talk about it. <laughs> so I just wanna um, acknowledge that it is 401, so we are yeah, at time. Um, are there any other just pressing items before we hop off the call? Matthew or Dr. Cog team, anything that we need to be aware of or any uh, final comments from folks? Uh, Jaya, I just had one comment is that I, I, based on what I just heard too, is that I can't help but wonder if COVID has provided us with some opportunities to improve uh, bus travel, bus travel downtown, bus rapid transit, because we we do have less vehicles on the roadway and could we be doing things on a pilot project uh, right now that might lead to greater ridership, greater bus ridership? If, if um, we could improve the reliability of the travel times with our buses because we've got less vehicles on the road and we can dedicate lanes or a portion of lanes. Um, yeah. I think there's an, uh, there's, that to me is an operational issue. And, and I yeah. kind of feel like we've got this opportunity with COVID that I, I really hope somebody is looking at that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, like they show up and Quebec has one less lane down south. And they're <laughs> like, oh, look, they changed it. And they didn't even know. It's like when they did it on 15th Street downtown. Like, yeah. all of a sudden, it was only two lanes. I, think I, I was just going to add, I think, Jackie, this is probably a good opportunity for us as a committee to look to our partners, our city partners that have said they're really interested in partnering with this conversation or with us as a committee. City of Denver, others, I think we can start to, to identify what do pilots look like. So thank you for lifting that up. Bye, everybody. Sorry to have to go. Yeah, no. Great. Well, thank you, everyone. Matthew, is there anything else? Otherwise, I think we're good to wrap up. Nope. 
Uh, just point out that uh, Heather's correct. Uh, they RTD shared the password uh, program working group information, and it's on the uh, the um, on the in the library there with all the other documents. But if there's anything more we can need, we can request it. Otherwise, thank you. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. Have a good rest of your evening. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.